Hi, it's Dr. Simeon Roger, and welcome to another one of our series of videos on Russia's invasion of Ukraine 2022. Now, this one is very particular. This one is a military technology primer, and this is definitely for you if you work for a news agency, if you're a YouTuber, if you're anyone reporting on the conflict. And for that matter, if you're simply anyone who wants to really know what's going on and be able to distinguish right from wrong, good reporting from bad reporting, stick around. So we're going to be talking about military equipment, needless to say. So in this short video, I'm going to help you do a few things. Now, please understand, this came from frustration. Frustration of news reports with inaccurate analyses, uh, videos with absurd titles or thumbnails. Now, you may think that because you don't understand the basics of military technology, no one else cares about those details either. Guess what? Millions of people in your potential audience do know this stuff. And when they see what you're presenting, they won't even bother with you. So maybe it's because the image you're showing has nothing to do with what you're saying. That happens a lot. Maybe because your analysis is transparently wrong, transparently implausible. Or maybe just because the terminology you're using shows you don't understand the basic technology well enough to be commenting on the matter at all. Now today I hope to help you change that to improve the quality of what you're about to put out there and to reach more people, which after all is the whole goal of this. So let's begin right away. We're gonna dive right into it. We're gonna start talking about stuff in a minute, but caveat, it's impossible to cover everything in one short video, but we'll hit the highlights. And that alone should fix 90% of the problem. So let's get to it. Now, one of the problems that we have here is about tanks. So let's talk about main battle tanks. Everything seems to be identified as a tank. Every vehicle that isn't a truck somehow gets labeled as a tank. It becomes ridiculous. So how do you know you're dealing with a tank? Well, first of all, let's talk about the words main battle tank, okay? That's an expression, an MBT, a main battle tank. The distinction between heavy tanks, medium tanks, and light tanks, or certainly between heavy and medium, that went away in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And then from then on, countries began to develop what's called a main battle tank. One tank that is their primary uh, assault weapon, if you will, primary piece of armor. Yes, there were a few, still a few light tanks around, but very, very few. Frankly, people can't figure out what to do with them. So when we talk about tanks, we're really talking about main battle tanks. So let's have a look at main battle tanks and what distinguishes a main battle tank, in other words, just a tank generically, from any other vehicle. So here we have the American M M1 Abrams, the specifically an M1A2. Uh, now this is not being used in theater, but it's a great example of what to look for in a tank. What is being used in theater is the Russian T-72. This is a T-72B3, the latest model and uh, found everywhere in this, this particular conflict. So how do you know you're dealing with a tank? Very simple. First of all, tanks have a large cannon. A large cannon with a long barrel. The long barrel is essential to give the projectiles velocity. There is one particular type of projectile, the main one that tanks use to destroy other tanks, called an armor-piercing fin-stabilized discarding sable, if you care, that requires extreme velocity in order to work. So tanks have long cannons. The next thing tanks have is a turret a turret that is capable of rotating 360 degrees and that turret is almost always placed in approximately the middle of the chassis this also means the engine is at the rear of the chassis and tanks always have tracks always if it does not have tracks in modern parlance it is not a tank okay so if you come up with a, if you see a wheeled vehicle it is definitely not a tank now here's the problem if you see a vehicle that has a long cannon, something that appears, at least appears to be a turret and has tracks, does that mean it's a tank? Actually, uh, not quite. There's one small problem, and that's with self-propelled artillery. So self-propelled artillery, a pretty explanatory, self-explanatory term. Typical self-propelled artillery. This is Russia's 2S3 Akatsia. It's a self-propelled 152 millimeter howitzer. Now, what you'll notice is that there is a turret and vehicles like this will typically have what is a turret or appears to be a turret okay whether or not it's capable of rotating isn't even the point 
the thing is, this is not a tank. So how do we know this? Well, typically, the best thing to look for is where's the engine? So the engine on this vehicle is at the front, and that's very typical of self-propelled artillery. There's a reason for putting the turret at the back. That whole structure at the back, the turret and the hull, tend to open up in the for the firing process. Uh, so that's it's often carried out almost in open air at the back to enable the loading of the gun and et cetera, et cetera. So this is what self-propelled artillery often looks like. There are many other kinds in use. We can't go over them all, and that's not our purpose, but just to basically explain the difference. But you'll notice if you want to, you know, if you're thinking about a tank, what does a tank have? It has a long cannon, has a turret, has tracks. Well, of course, this thing does have a long cannon, <laughs> has what appears to be a turret and has tracks. So you do have to be a little careful. Another thing that's often mistaken, mistaken, mistakenly labeled a tank is an infantry fighting vehicle or an IFV. What's an IFV? Let's have a look. This is a very typical example. This is Russia's BMP-3, the latest iteration of the famous BMP, uh, which first came into service. The BMP-1 first came into service about 1967 and is really the sort of the prototype, uh, you might say, of all IFVs worldwide. And another typical example, not in theater, of course, but the American Bradley, uh, the M2A2 Bradley, infantry fighting vehicle. So there are lots of infantry fighting vehicles out there. Now, how do you distinguish an infantry fighting vehicle from something else? Well, first of all, they do have cannons. So an infantry fighting vehicle will have a gun. In other words, it has to be able to fight, hence it's a fighting vehicle. The infantry fighting vehicle's purpose is to carry infantry, which it does typically in the back. So there's actually going to be room in the vehicle to carry fully equipped troops. Tanks don't have that. Tanks have no spare room for troops. Okay, yes, I know the Israeli Markava is an outlier in that respect, but every other tank has no room for anybody inside except the crew. IFVs have room for troops. That's the whole purpose. They're there to take troops into the battle area, not too far behind the main battle tanks. Okay, so if you're looking for an IFV, you, you definitely, you know, it has to be a vehicle that carries troops. It will have a gun which is going to be smaller than a tank's main cannon. And it typically has a turret. Now, that turret may be manned or it may be unmanned. Uh, notice, however, a <laughs> little caveat here. Infantry fighting vehicles do not always have tracks. You can have an infantry fighting vehicle that, in fact, is a wheeled vehicle. Okay, so you just have to know that the tracks, <laughs> tracks are wheeled. Both varieties exist. And infantry fighting vehicles also will often carry launchers for anti-tank guided weapons, guided missiles. Anti-tank guided missiles, very frequent. So that's how you essentially distinguish an infantry fighting vehicle. Now, there's a bit of a gray area between an infantry fighting vehicle and what is really technically kind of its predecessor, but which still exists, which is the Armored Personnel Carrier, or APC. So the purpose of the Armored Personnel Carrier, or APC, was, again, to carry troops into battle, uh, but it was a much more sort of restrained, restricted version or vision of, the, of, that, of that task uh, and this this was from the you know essentially the 1950s when these became popular. The whole purpose was just pr to provide a vehicle that had enough armor uh, that it could carry some troops toward the front line and protect them from small arms fire and shrapnel. Now let's have a look at a couple of these. This is the Russian BTR-80 armor personnel carrier. It's everywhere in this conflict. Uh, another one is the tracked MTLB, also Russian. Uh, which can function as an APC. It also has multiple other uses. So why, what, makes this, what makes these things APCs as opposed to infantry fighting vehicles? Well, the distinction is kind of a gray area. Typically, uh, as we said wheels or tracks doesn't make a difference, um, but APCs typically have a smaller gun. They have less sophisticated optics on those guns. Uh, they may have an unmanned turret with something, some small small weapon in it. But I mean, hey, if your turret has nothing more than a machine gun, you're definitely not an infantry fighting vehicle. You don't rate. You don't make the cut. You're just an APC. So APCs are all over the place. Of course, there are many kinds, tracked, wheeled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's go on from here. <clears throat> Let's get into a different kind of artillery. We looked at essentially self-propelled artillery, which is always going to be tube artillery, meaning it's a it's a it's a gun. It shoots stuff. <laughs> Now we're going to look at multiple launch rocket systems, a different type of artillery. Very typical example, the Russian BM-21 Grad, which we see everywhere in this conflict. 
Uh, the BM21 Grad is a little bit of an older system. It's a direct relative or descendant of the famous uh, BM13 known as Katyusha during World War II, the Katyusha, which so terrified the Germans uh, and which was really the, the original multiple launch rocket system. There are lots of others you'll see. Uh, this is a newer, larger Russian one, the BM30 Smerch. And you'll also note this is the, UM, the US uh, M270, M uh, which is now in Ukrainian hands, I believe, and making its way to the front lines. In fact, some reports put it already there. Very, very potent system. Now, these systems have vastly different capabilities, depends on, on what it is. You'll notice some are tracked, some can be wheeled. It doesn't really matter. So between tr tracks and wheels, you can't tell. The, the overwhelming distinguishing feature, of course, is having a whole bunch of tubes. And those tubes, of course, launch rockets. Uh, typically, those rockets are unguided, hence the word rocket is being used. Typically, what's the difference between a missile and a rocket? Well, in most parlance, a missile refers to something that has a guidance system. A rocket refers to something that doesn't. So despite that, however, multiple launch rocket systems are now capable of launching rockets, quote unquote, that do have uh, some form of terminal guidance. In any case, the range of these things great, uh, varies greatly. The, the American M270 is capable of range of up to 70 kilometers, which is pretty much double the range of most tube artillery. And these are extremely potent weapons. Uh, there's a reason that the US M270, for example, is referred to in, uh, you know, uh, in slang as the grid square eliminator because it, it will eliminate an entire grid square on a map. A lot of firepower in these things. Let's talk about anti-tank guided missiles, ATGMs, and how they are different from anti-tank rocket launchers. So this is a US Javelin anti-tank guided missile. Javelin's a good example. The British NLAW is a good example. These are anti-tank guided missiles. So when you launch the missile, the missile is highly sophisticated. It has a homing mechanism. It will find the target. Anti-tank guided missiles have shaped charge warheads. Uh, they don't have to hit the target with extreme velocity. They just have to hit it. The shape charge does the rest. And they come in at the target from various angles, depending on the, the weapon's design. Uh, Javelin's very particular. It does a top, not only does a top attack, so it attack, attacks the top of the vehicle, and law does that too, but Javelin actually adopts an almost looping ballistic trajectory to come down on its target. Uh, whereas a lot of anti-tank guided missiles just fly straight at the target. But however it works, these are guided weapons. And the latest versions of these guided weapons, of course, do not require the operator to track the target actively. Once the missile is locked on, it will find the target all by itself. And Javelin and Inlaw have been extremely dangerous. They have probably destroyed by now hundreds of Russian tanks in this conflict. Now, anti-tank guided missiles, which are, as you see here, they can be man portable. They can be pretty heavy, but they can be man portable. There is another class of weapon, which is an older class of weapon, but still very useful, which is the anti-tank rocket launcher. And here are a couple examples. This is the German Panzerfaust III, which is quite modern. And it's a much older predecessor, the famous or infamous and well-known Russian RPG-7. RPG-7 often translated as rocket propelled grenade. Actually, what it means is a rocket propelled anti-tank grenade launcher. So these are anti-tank weapons uh, or anti-vehicle weapons, if you wish, uh, and they have hollow charge warheads designed to penetrate armor. However, they are not guided. Okay, with these, the operator has to aim. You have to aim. If your aim's good, you hit. If your aim is bad, you don't. And they have much more limited range, whereas anti-tank guided missiles are often good for ranges of two, three, five kilometers. Um, anti-tank rocket launchers typically are only good for, well, a couple of hundred meters. It's hard to get anything accurate out of them beyond two, three hundred meters. Um, and, you know, if you're aiming at a tank with one of these things, you really want to find the perfect area, the perfectly vulnerable, most vulnerable area of the tank to hit. You just don't want to, you know, shoot it anywhere. So you want to get even closer than that. So those are anti-tank guided missiles as opposed to anti-tank rocket launchers. Big difference. Both very important. Warship. A warship is not a battleship. Okay. These words are not synonymous. Any combat vessel is a warship. Any combat vessel is a warship. Okay. 
but not a battleship. A battleship is a type of worship, and it's a type of worship that does not exist anymore. So please don't label uh, videos with this. Uh, please don't say that the Ukrainians sank the Russian battleship Moskva. They didn't. They sank the Russian cruiser Moskva. Um, battleships are no longer extant. They no longer exist. Now, this is a battleship. This is an American Iowa-class battleship, to be specific. At the end, end of World War II, all great powers with battleships uh, got rid of them. They scrapped them or they mothballed them. Yes, the U.S. pulled two Iowa-class battleships out of mothballs in the 1980s and 90s, uh, but those are no longer serving either. So warships, if you think about classifications of surface warships, the ones you need to think about are, of course, in descending order of tonnage or of size, cruisers, destroyers, and frigates. Those are the big three, cruisers, destroyers, and frigates. So how do you know when you see a, a ship, how do you know if it's a cruiser, a destroyer, or a frigate? Well, let me tell you this. Visually, you probably don't know. I mean, unless you know the specific class and know all the details, you probably don't know. From the size, you cannot tell. From the configuration, you cannot tell. <clears throat> and the idea of distinguishing what's a cruiser or destroyer or frigate based on how large it is, meaning, for instance, the tonnage of the ship, uh, that's kind of gone by the boards because all of this in the last few decades has been in a big state of flux. <clears throat> you know, if you think of World War II, an average destroyer like a British tribal class or an American Fletcher class was maybe 2,000 tons soaking wet. 2,000 tons today is not a destroyer. It's probably not even a frigate or barely. It's probably a, more of a corvette. Okay, so here's an illustration. This is Russia's Cresta II class. Technically, a large anti-submarine ship in Russian parlance, meaning its primary mission was anti-submarine warfare, but Cresta was always referred to as a cruiser in the West. Now that ship is 7,500 tons and just about 160 meters long. And that's in 1971, we referred to a vessel of that size as a cruiser, okay? But barely a decade later, out came its uh, successor, its successor, the Udaloy One class, which in the West has always been referred to as a destroyer, never as a cruiser, even though Udaloy is exactly the same size as Cresta II, just about exactly. So why is that? Again, it's just kind of uh, this creeping change in classification. You know, you, it's hard to refer to something of 7,500 tons as a cruiser when we have destroyers across the globe now that are approaching 10,000 tons. So in other words, if you don't know what classification to slap on a warship, the, here's the very best policy for you. Go find out what the owner says it is and use that. Use the designation they give it. No one will contradict you. Okay, no one will contradict you. Oh, I love this. This was an actual um, title on a YouTube video, uh, from what I remember, at least. I, I might have slightly reworded it, but you get the gist. Ukraine destroys carrier. And this is an illustration of why you need to know how words are used by people who do understand military parlance. Ukraine destroys carrier. Well, anyone who knows military affairs, immediately when they see the word carrier used alone, they only think of one thing. And it isn't this. <laughs> this is an armored personnel carrier. It's a Russian BTR. And this is what the person who made the video meant. Ukraine destroys carrier. Yeah, an armored personnel carrier. But when we think of carriers, the word carrier to anyone who knows means this. That's all it conjures up in the mind. Ukraine destroys carrier. Well, of course, this is an, Amer an American Nimitz class carrier. So when we think of Ukraine destroying a carrier, well, I guess it had to be a Russian carrier. That would have been Admiral Kuznetsov, their only air aircraft carrier. But Ukraine couldn't have destroyed the Kuznetsov because it's thousands of kilometers away in a shipyard getting refitted. So there we go. This is how things get mixed up. The word carrier alone is conjures up the image of a warship, it has nothing to do with an armored vehicle. So it's very important to be able to use the words the way people do in who understand military affairs. And, you know, that's just the way it is in any field of human knowledge. There's a particular parlance that people understand. If you don't know that parlance, then when you make a mistake, you look like you don't know what you're talking about. So let's talk about drones, UAVs and UCAVs. So when most people think of a drone, they think of the little thing you can buy for a thousand bucks at Walmart or whatever. 
the little uh, drone like this. And this can be called a drone or an unmanned aerial vehicle, or technically this one, of course, is a quadcopter since it has four little helicopter blades. And in this conflict, though, in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the main drone, quote unquote, that we're most used to seeing or most used to hearing about probably is undoubtedly the Turkish TB2 Bayraktar, which now the Bayraktar is technically what we call a UCAV, an unmanned combat aerial vehicle. What that means is it's a drone, but it's armed. And you can see that it's armed here. It has uh, anti-tank missiles under its or anti-whatever anti missiles under its wings. Uh, it can attack ground targets. It can destroy things on the ground and does that really, really well. So that's a UCAV. Now, of course, it can be used for simple reconnaissance, like most other types of drones, uh, like even the quadcopter, which would, in that role, it would be kind of acting as a UAV. Uh, here's another type of drone, the American Switchblade 600. There are two types of uh, the American Switchblade, the 300 and the 600, but uh, basically, this is a very different type of drone. This is a kamikaze drone. Yes, it can be used for surveillance, absolutely, for reconnaissance, in other words, no problem. However, when the operator finds a target, what they will do is they will crash this drone into that target. So in other words, the switchblade doesn't carry weapons like the Bayraktar does. It is the weapon. It is the weapon. And it can loiter over the battlefield for a significant amount of time and wait until it finds a target. So another word for that is a loitering munition. It's a loitering munition. And there are two types of the American switchblade, as I think I said, the 300 and the 600. The 600 is the larger of the two. We'll see the 300 in a little bit. So that's a little bit of a primer on drones, UAVs and UCAFs for you. Surface to air missile systems, very important. What's more important than SAM systems? Not much. So let's have a look at a couple of SAM systems. Typical SAM system. This is a SAM system. This is a Russian Buk M2. <clears throat> uh, this one, I think, in Ukrainian service, but it is a Buk M2. It is a Soviet or Russian design. Uh, it is known in the West as surface-to-air missile number 17 NATO codename Grizzly, or SA-17 Grizzly. Here's another one. This is a SAM. This is Russia's S-300V. Not the typical S-300, but the S-300V. Uh, also known as SA-12. Uh, this version is known as the Giant. And it, as you see, it has tubes. Now, see, one of the interesting things about SAM systems is you can't always tell if you're looking at a SAM system unless you know what to look for. The fact that it, these two vehicles both happen to have tracks is irrelevant. Many SAM systems have wheels. Um, SAM systems may, the missiles may be evident, they may be right out there in front of you as they are in the Buk system, or they may be held in a container as they are in this S-300V. So this S-300, also known as SA-12. Um, however, when you see vehicles that look like these, here's the problem for you. When you see vehicles that look like these, they may not be SAM systems. Okay, so you really have to know the systems or be able to research them in order to find out what you're looking at. This, for instance, is not a SAM. This is Russia's BAL-E anti-ship coastal defense missile system. Coastal defense using the switchblade of Iran missile system. Um, in other words, it's not a SAM. It looks like it could be, but it isn't, right? Same with this one. This is Russia's Iskander K cruise missile system. So it's a land attack cruise missile system, not a SAM system. So you really do have to know the systems or be, be quite careful uh, when you're looking at them. And it's from simply from looks alone, you cannot tell what something is unless you know the system. So that is hazardous. Definitely ask an expert and don't get into trouble. And of course, there are man portable air defense systems or man pads, of which the most famous is the US Stinger. There are several other types in theater now, uh, French and British types, as well as Russian types, Russian, old Russian Strela or Nuri Glas systems. And man pads, a man pads is a type of SAM system, okay? It's a surface to air missile. That's its purpose. It shoots down aircraft, but it is man portable. So a man portable air defense system or man pads. Let's talk about cruise missile confusion. The term cruise missile causes all sorts of confusion and guess what, it has for decades, so it's okay. So here we go, cruise missile. Let's have a look at something typical. 
<clears throat> this is Russia's Kaliber land attack cruise missile. You've heard lots about it. Dozens and dozens of these have struck Ukraine, whether launched from uh, aircraft or launched from uh, ships or submarines. This is Kaliber. It's not the only cruise missile the Russians have used against land targets in Ukraine. They've used lots of others. Their most numerous air-launched cruise missiles are things like the the Ha 100 in English. Let's see, Kh 101, things like that. Kh is the Russian letter Ha. Um, but anyway, let's have a look at what distinguishes a cruise missile. So when you look at this, um, well, here's something you can think about. If you look at other languages and how they uh, what their term is for the word cruise missile, it tells you a lot. The French translation, if we do it literally, is an aerodynamic missile. The Russian translation is a winged missile. Okay, Kralapia Rakieva is a winged missile. And you'll see here that Kaliber has wings, right? So it looks a bit like a mini aircraft. So it's very typical of cruise missiles, typical of things like the American Tomahawk. And uh, cruise missiles, there are a few things you need to know about cruise missiles. First, they can be launched, launched from in, pretty much anywhere. You have ground-launched cruise missiles, air-launched cruise missiles, uh, ship-launched or submarine-launched cruise missiles. So where it's launched from doesn't really tell you that much. The other thing to, to understand is cruise missiles have been around for a very long time as a concept, really since the, pretty much since <laughs> Nazi Germany's uh, um, a V1 buzz bomb, okay, that was used to attack London in World War II. That is really kind of the prototype of a cruise missile. Um, cruise missiles have been around forever. Before the 1970s, however, they tended to be very large, very heavy, very bulky and impractical, and they were not terribly accurate. During the 1970s, several technical problems were solved. One had to do with propulsion. It was then became possible to, to produce a quite small missile, a very economical small missile that could fly at, to an extreme range of several thousand kilometers. The other technological advance was in guidance systems. Guidance systems that allowed the missile to be extremely accurate, but not only accurate, but allowed it to evade air defense by flying very low. This type of gui guidance system was referred to as terrain comparison or TERCOM, and it allowed the missile to both fly low and avoid other ge sort of match its its uh, trajectory to the geographic features thereby avoiding enemy air defense radars and also to find the target and be very accurate now one of the problems is when you use the word cruise missile it can refer to a couple of things so it can refer to something that attacks a land target as this this particular version of caliber does it can also refer to anti-ship missiles so this is an American Harpoon anti-ship cruise missile, one of the best known anti-ship missiles worldwide. <clears throat> and you'll notice there's a bit of difference in configuration. <clears throat> uh, the, the Harpoon almost looks like it could be a, could be a surface to air missile, for example, just by its configuration. Uh, but you know, it, you can ignore the configuration. The fact is the Harpoon ad adopts a sea skimming trajectory also to avoid detection. And like most anti-ship missiles, that's what it does. Now, anti-ship cruise missiles and land attack cruise missiles are different in one particular vein. That is, they have different guidance systems. In order to destroy a warship, you need to home in on it. To home in on it, you need either active radar homing or imaging infrared. If you don't have those, you're not going to hit the ship. Okay, ships move. That's a That makes them hard to hit through anything else. Unlike fixed targets on land, when you have a fixed target on land, you can use a different type of homing. You can you can use GPS or its Russian equivalent, Glosnas, for instance. And so typically any cruise missile is used for either one purpose or the other purpose. It's actually only recently, fairly recently, that people have begun to develop cruise missiles with that give you the option of either attacking a ship or attacking a land target. And there aren't that many missiles out there that integrate these two options. <clears throat> Kaliber, even though it's relatively new, does not do that. What Kaliber does is that there's a different version for anti-ship use. So the anti-ship Kaliber, you'll see this one is designated 3M14. 3M14 is the land attack variant. The anti-ship variant is 3M54. So that's a little bit about cruise missiles, and that's why there's a lot of confusion. When you talk about cruise missiles, it's important to distinguish land attack cruise missiles from anti-ship cruise missiles. 
Now let's talk about tactical ballistic missiles. So ballistic missiles differ from cruise missiles in that ballistic missiles have ballistic trajectories. In other words, they attack their target in a high looping arc and plunge on the target with extreme velocity. In fact, with hypersonic velocity a lot of the time. So if anyone says hypersonics are new, uh, well, not so much. <clears throat> in the foreground, you see that that's a whole other topic. I'm not gonna get into hypersonics in this video. We actually addressed it in a different one. Uh, not going to go down that rabbit hole right this minute. In the foreground, you have the Russian Iskander M tactical ballistic missile. The vehicle behind it is the Iskander K land attack cruise missile, uh, which we we saw previously. But the uh, the Iskander M has been used multiple times by the Russians against Ukrainian targets and continues to be used. <clears throat> Seriously, Sarmat. If you haven't heard the word Sarmat, you probably haven't been paying attention to the news. Sarmat is a relatively new Russian ICBM. It was just tested for the first time. And of course, the Russians are spending a great deal of time building propaganda around the Sarmat. It's, Sarmat is their new heavy ICBM, their new monster missile, so to speak. Just for a little bit of background, the Russians have always had a monster missile. They always have one ICBM that is an absolute monster, an absolute beast. It used to be in the 1960s, it was the old SS-9. Then it was the SS-18. Now it's a Sarmat. <clears throat> I, I used NATO designations there for the other two. Anyway, here's the Sarmat. This is Sarmat. It's a monster, right? It's 35 meters long. This is Russia's RS-28 Sarmat ICBM. Now, ever since the Russians tested this very recently and started pouring out a whole bunch of propaganda about it, every time I see an image of a Russian ICBM now or a video about anything to do with a Russian ICBM, suddenly everything is labeled Sarmat. That is wrong. Not a Sarmat. This is an RS-24 Yars ICBM. Yars is different from Sarmat. Yars is 12 meters shorter than Sarmat, okay? And more than that, Yars is, is mobile. Russia has a bunch of mobile ICBMs. Topol, Topol M, and Yars. Okay, all of those are road mobile, which makes them hard to hit. Sarmat is an absolute monster. It has to be launched from a silo, a fixed silo, a, something you dig in the ground a huge huge installation a subterranean installation that's what's required to launch a sarmat okay so big difference not every icbm is a sarmat relax so but russian propaganda also makes mistakes like this and, and says stupid things uh, now this is a this image is taken from russian television from the channel uh russia one russia Din, which is uh russia one and the translation of the title here, or the text, says uh, flight time of an RS-28 Sarmat ICBM to the, to the capital cities of countries who have given Ukraine the most weapons. And you'll see the, in red the targets. We have London, we have Paris, we have Berlin, and they're giving the flight time in seconds. But they're launching it, the notion here is they would launch it from their enclave in Kaliningrad. Got news for you, folks. You're never going to put a Sarmat into Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad is far too small for the massive construction project of a Sarmat base. Uh, besides, when you dig silos for ICBMs, you space them uh, several kilometers apart so that no one nuclear blast can destroy them all. And you're not going to dig in, you know, dig up Kaliningrad, which is quite small, for the purpose of putting in one silo. There would be absolutely no military or even psychological advantage for doing so. So Russian propagandists get ahead of themselves too. They don't understand this stuff any more than most other people do. Now let's talk about designation confusion. There's a lot of confusion about weapons designations, and this can lead to uh, it can lead to people talking about things that are sort of if you will, off topic, it can be, lead to using the wrong illustration for your article or for your video. So let's talk about how this works. And for the purposes, illustrative purposes, we're gonna talk about one particular vehicle, which is here being towed by a Ukrainian tractor, towed away as most Russian vehicles end up being. So it's towed away, and what is this? Well, this is this particular vehicle. This is a Russian SAM system, uh, an older battlefield tactical SAM system. And let's have a look at the different names for it. So these two things are the same type of vehicle, okay? 
So let's have a look. The typical Russian SAM system. Now, the Russian industrial designation for this system is 9K33. The industrial designations, also known as GRAU designations, GREU, are really confusing. All Russian equipment has a GRAU designation, and believe me, it's confusing and not terribly memorable. And because of that, the Russians give the system a cover name so they can remember it. So everybody can. And it, the cover name of this particular system is OSA. OSA means wasp. Uh, that's another thing. If you see Russian cover names or Russian ship names, for example, it's very important to, to know how to pronounce them. So the Ukrainians did not sink, sink the cruiser Moskva. They sank the cruiser Moskva. Okay, Google, Google can tell you how to trans, how to sorry pronounce anything you wish in Russian. Uh, avail yourself of that functionality. Um, now, the Western alphanumeric designation of this system is SA-8, surface-to-air missile number eight. Its NATO code name is Gecko. Now, some Russian missiles have different cover names for the export version. So earlier, we saw the Kaliber cruise missile. The export version of the Kaliber cruise missile is known as Klub. Similarly, sometimes, and it doesn't apply to the ASA system, it does apply to another system we'll see in a minute, that uh, sometimes the naval version of a surface-to-air missile system, for example, will be have a different cover name from the Army's version. Not the case with this system. Both are known as ASA, but sometimes the cover name will differ. Other types of confusion designation. Part two. Meet the Kinjal missile. Meet the other Kinjal missile, both Russian. Both of these weapons are known as Kinjal by the Russians. Kinjal means roughly translated a dagger. The one on the left carried by this MiG-31 Foxhound is the sort of their well-known hypersonic propaganda piece, uh, Kinjal missile that hits ground targets. Now that Kinjal missile carried by that MiG-31 -MiG that's essentially part of a ballistic missile. It is not true hypersonic technology, even though it does reach hypersonic speed. But the point here is it is designated Kinjal. But the Russians have another weapon system still in operation known as Kinjal, which is the naval version of their SA-15 system, also known by the NATO, well, the, the naval version is known by the, the uh, Elf, Western Alphanumeric designation SAN-9, surface to air naval missile number nine, and its code name is Gauntlet. Gauntlet is a code name for both the land-based and sea-based versions in the West. The Russians have a different name for the land-based and sea-based versions. The land-based version is known as Tor, T-O-R, and the naval version is known as Kinjal, which unfortunately happens to be the same, the same name as this new hypersonic propaganda piece. So there can be big confusion about that. And I've seen people confuse these. I even saw a publication on Russian SAM systems that uh, put out a picture of the Kinjal uh, hypersonic air-to-surface missile when it should have had a picture of the surface-to-air missile system. So people do get these confused. And that's very typical, but this confusion can have other dimensions too. Meet switchblade, which we've already kind of mentioned. This is the, the American uh, switchblade drone. This is a smaller version, the, the Switchblade 300 being launched by a soldier from a tube. And this is also Switchblade. So the one on the right is a Russian, a standard Russian uh, anti-ship missile. Standard anti-ship cruise missile, you'll notice it looks a lot like the American Harpoon, which probably inspired its design. Um, and the Ukrainian Neptune anti-ship missile is based very much on this Russian Switchblade missile. Now, Switchblade is a NATO code name. In Western parlance, this missile, this miss, missile is known as the SSN-25 Switchblade, surface-to-surface -surface naval number 25 NATO codename Switchblade. It's an anti-ship cruise missile, subsonic, moderate range, 160 kilometers or whatever, and, you know, kind of typical. The Russian designation for this missile is Uran. The cover name is Uran. Uh, and it's also the missile used in what we saw earlier, that Ball e coastal defense system. So... This is a problem. Uh, you got to be careful with names. Okay, what else? 
Yeah, if there's any way our team can support you by double checking your content or providing strategic or tactical analysis, just let us know using the contact information in the description. We're happy to help you. We want to see more and better reporting out there and we'll do everything we can to help. As I said, we couldn't cover everything here. Uh, maybe we'll do a different one to different video to cover some of the things we missed here, like the fact that not every Kalashnikov assault rifle is an AK-47. Actually, almost none of the ones you see are, but that's a whole other story. Uh, there we go. So stay strong, support Ukraine and relief efforts any way you can. Wish you all the best and we'll see you again soon. That's it for now. Take care.